chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Spring planning isn't just for your house. Get your finances in order too, starting with tossing out that old wireless and signing up for a new one for just $15 a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower, above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 15, Episode 12. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing three tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Brian Martinez, Warren Peace, and Mike Mann. Tonight, we'll hear stories of ghoulish ghosties, intense isolation, and outrageous organs. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail, so lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. <laughs> the show is about to begin. <laughs> Asia is a fascinating place, with all kinds of different cultures and a vast landscape. From the jungles of the Pacific Islands to the bustling cities of India, to mysteries of China and Japan, there's no shortage of interesting things that want to see you dead, or at least make you wish you were. Come, then, as we drop into a world of strange beings and even stranger victims. Brian Martinez kicks things off with a ghostly presence you may find somewhat familiar, of a haunting presence that just seems unwilling to leave a young lady alone. If only there was some way of getting them to find peace. If peace is what they really want. Without further ado, I present to you 
Tick, tick. Looking down at her phone, Aiko shivered under her thin coat. She'd missed her train back to Shibuya, and now she had to wait a full 30 minutes for the next one. In some ways, this was all thanks to her manager, Mr. Takada. The week before, Aiko had missed another of his impossible deadlines. She could still hear his voice ringing in her ears. I can count on you this time, right, Aiko? So, of course, she stayed after for an hour to finish up her work. An hour that became two hours, then three. She'd run all the way to Asakusa Station and reach the platform just in time to see her train pulling away. The emptiness of the train station platform set her teeth on edge. The fluorescent lights buzzed with a dying hum, throwing her long shadow down on the tracks below. She was almost grateful for the chance to put off going back to her apartment. Things weren't going well at work, but at home they were going even worse. She lived by herself these days, and she was terribly lonely, especially with no dating prospects. The few friends she had left were too busy with their own lives to console her about hers. Alone at the train station, Aiko's thoughts turned to a girl she hadn't thought of in years. What was her name again? Yuki? No, Yumi. The quiet girl who always waited by herself at the train to school with her favorite book in hand. She must have read that book a thousand times, judging by how dog-eared it had become. Memories flickered through Aiko's eyes like passing lights. She thought of the few times she'd spoken to Yumi, how she felt sorry for the girl. And yet Aiko didn't dare risk her status with her friends by befriending Yumi or warning her of the things to come. As she leaned over the yellow safety line, looking for the telltale headlights of her train, Aiko's ears perked up. A sound had come to her attention that at first she thought was her imagination, playing tricks on her. But the more she listened, the more she was convinced it was real. It was a faint scraping sound, like something dragging across concrete. Not only that, it was growing closer. Tick! Tick. She glanced around the empty platform, trying to figure out the source of the unnerving sound making its way toward her. It sounded like animal claws scraping along the ground. Tick. Tick. It didn't take long to realize it was coming from the train tracks. She turned away and walked toward the station wall, trying not to see whatever rat or other filthy vermin might crawl out from below. She wanted to close her eyes, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. Aiko couldn't stand the sight of rats, but the thought of one sneaking up on her while she had her eyes closed sounded even worse. Tick! A flicker of white caught her eye, reflected in the wall tile in front of her. A pale, skeletal face, long black hair obscuring its features, stared up at her from the floor. Aiko stumbled sideways, a scream trapped in her throat. She ran from the station and didn't look back. That night, Aiko dreamed of walking down Kinchy Street, the path she used to take home from school every day after the train. Usually it was noisy with the afternoon crowd of workers and students and a handful of tourists visiting the shops. But now the street was deserted. There were no street vendors, no locals riding their bicycles, not even a sparrow or a stray cat passed her as she made her way down the street. In the distance, she finally saw someone. It was Yumi, the shy girl from school, but for some odd reason, she was down on the ground. Perhaps she'd dropped her book and was picking it up. Aiko tried to call out to her to ask her what she was doing, but her voice made no sound. As Aiko walked toward Yumi, she noticed the girl's back was hunched in an awkward position. What's more, she was dragging herself along the pavement, her fingernails making the most awful sound as they scraped the pavement. Tick, tick. As she got closer, Aiko saw the raw, gaping wound where Yumi's legs should have been. Aiko woke up screaming. Somebody was holding her arms down to the bed, and she fought them with everything she had. 
Then she realized her sheets had tangled around her body, trapping her. She threw them off like she was fending off a wild dog and sat up gasping. The sound of her own panicked breathing filled the small apartment. Her heart was racing so fast that the, she could see it twitch in her chest. She tried to calm down, telling herself it was all in her mind, just a dream. But relief didn't come until morning, when the sun shone through her bedroom window and burned the shadows away. Aiko took a taxi to work, even though it cost four times as much as the train. She didn't want to set foot in another train station as long as she lived. At work, she was happy to find Mr. Takeda was leaving her alone, probably because she handed in her work on time, and he had little to say to her except to complain. By lunchtime, she'd fallen into her usual routine and could almost feel herself into feeling at ease. As she walked into the break room, she thought of calling her old friend Sakura. If anyone knew what she was going through, it was her. They'd gone to school together, seen the same things, made the same mistakes. It had been too long since they'd talked. But as she crossed the break room, a chill overtook her, as if a draft had entered the room through one of the windows. Ignoring the feeling, she made her way to the refrigerator to retrieve her lunch. As she reached for the handle, a sudden movement caught her eye, a flicker of movement in the reflection of the metal door. She turned in panic, but there was nothing there, just the familiar sight of an empty break room full of tables and chairs and a sink to clean dishes. Aiko shook it off and quickly reheated her lunch in the microwave, taking a seat by the window. She tried to focus on her meal, but the feeling stayed with her, like an unwelcomed guest seated across from her. A minute or so later, she felt the change in the air again. It was as obvious as stepping into cold bath water. The room grew quiet as if drained of all oxygen, all life. Aiko looked up from her lunch, shocked to see a figure huddled in the corner of the break room. It was a twisted, grotesque form, its legs nothing but bloodied stumps. Then it looked up at her. A horrifying scream stretched across its face, revealing a mouthful of shattered teeth. Aiko froze. The apparition's eyes, empty and cold, locked onto hers. The mangled figure began to drag itself across the floor. It inched closer and closer to where Aiko sat, frozen in fear, leaving behind it a streaking trail of blackened blood and gore. Tick! Tick! Its fingernail scraped the floor as it pulled itself toward her. Tick! Tick! Aiko tried to call out for help, but like the dream, no sound left her lips. She could only watch as the broken, bloodied figure came toward her, pulling itself with a silent scream splitting its face. Just as the broken thing reached out to her with its clawed, dirty hands, Aiko found the strength in her legs to move. She leapt to her feet and ran for the door, exploding from the break room as her voice finally gave way like a dam busting. Her co-workers jumped up and ran to her, holding her and asking her what was wrong. She pointed to the break room, trying to find the words. Moments later, Mr. Takeda made his way over from his office and asked what on earth was going on. A girl, Echo said, nearly in tears, an awful girl. Mr. Takeda frowned down at her. What girl? Aiko searched his face, then the others. From their expressions, she could tell none of them believed her. She glanced over her shoulder to show them the horrible girl that had attacked her. But the dark figure was gone, and with it, all blood, all evidence of it, vanished as if it was never there. As the days passed, as well as the sleepless nights... Huddled in bed with the lights on, the dragging sound followed Aiko everywhere. It was at work, beneath the murmuring of her co-workers. It was in the silence of her apartment building hallway, as she ran to her door clutching her key. It was even in the noise of crowded streets, where every young girl made her turn and walk the other way for fear of seeing their hideous mouths. It was her constant metronome, the sound of each miserable day falling off the calendar. Tick, tick. She couldn't type without shivering at the sound the keyboard made. 
She misspelled words, lost files, and forgot to send invoices. Mr. Takeda chastised her almost daily, either by email or standing over her desk, glaring down at her with that look once reserved for her father's face. One night, crouched in the corner of her apartment, Aiko squeezed her eyes shut, tears streaming down her face, and called Sakura. On the phone, she tried to sound as if everything was normal, as if the world wasn't crumbling around her. Oh, hey, Aiko, Sakura said, sounding distracted. Two hadn't spoken in over a year by Aiko's count, so Sakura's nonchalant tone took her by surprise. She sounded as if she were at work, even though Aiko knew she didn't have a job, never had the need for one. Still, it was comfort to hear a familiar voice, especially one she'd known for so long. After a few minutes of conversation, to which her friend only paid half attention, Aiko asked the question she'd called to ask, doing it as casually as she could imagine. She didn't want Sakura to think of her the way her co-workers did. Do you ever think of Yumi? There was a pause in the line. Then, tick, tick. The sound had returned. Aiko glanced nervously around her apartment, looking for shadows with hair and teeth. Who? Sakura replied, not noticing anything was wrong. When the sound came again, tick, tick, Aiko realized with horror that it was coming through the phone, mixing with Sakura's voice. Aiko wanted to shout in the receiver and warned her friend to run. Get out before you see her, before she ruins your life. Oh, stupid hangnail. Sakura mumbled to herself, and then Aiko realized the truth. Sakura was clipping her fingernails. Tick, tick. Sorry, who are you talking about? Sakura asked again, slightly annoyed. Yumi, from school, Aiko tried to recover. On the one hand, she was relieved to know where the sound was coming from, but on the other, each time it came, it was like a tap on an exposed nerve. Tick, tick. The dragging sound, like a silent scream only she could hear. Oh, that girl who jumped in front of a train? Aiko was alone, adrift. The next day, she missed another deadline. The day after that, she was fired. Echo stood in front of the crumbling two-story building that stuck up from the concrete like dried bone. It was the same district where she'd attended high school, but it was so different now. The old neighborhood had fallen to disrepair, the lively streets lined with closed shops and overflowing trash. A single red lantern hung above the entrance, swaying in the afternoon breeze. Taking a deep breath, Aiko pushed open the door and stepped inside. The inside of the building was dim and musty, filled with the stink of incense and old paper. A small figure sat hunched over a table painted in a shadow. Okami-san? Aiko's voice sounded strained, unused to conversation. And she hadn't spoken to anyone in days. The figure slowly straightened, relieving an old woman with white hair. It was her, the one she'd heard about, who could take and guide troubled souls. Deep lines were carved into the skin around her mouth and eyes. What troubles you, child? The woman asked, her voice raspy and brittle. When Aiko hesitated, the old woman gestured to the chair across from her. Aiko sat. Something is following me. A dark spirit, she managed. The old woman nodded, her jaundiced eyes studying Aiko. Do you know what this spirit might be? She asked, and Aiko's eyes filled up. The woman motioned to her to speak, but Aiko could barely look at her. There's no moving forward without looking backward, the woman said calmly. Aiko nodded, and then the words poured out. The train station buzzed with departing commuters and arriving travelers as Aiko and her classmates waited for their train. Aiko watched Yumi sit alone on a bench and bury her nose in the same book like she always did. Glancing back at her friends, she approached Yumi. What book is that you're always reading? 
she asked, trying to sound friendly. Yumi looked up, startled. Uh, oh, uh, it's called The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. It's an old folk tale, she replied, pushing the hair out of her face. Can I see it? Aiko asked, holding out her hand. Yumi hesitated, her small fingers tightening around the book. A look of doubt passed through her, but slowly she handed it over. Aiko took the book with a smile, studying the well-worn cover. It had an old block print on it, a beautiful princess covering her face with a fan. But instead of flipping through its pages, she surprised Yumi by bolting away with it. Yumi jumped to her feet and gave chase, calling out for her to stop. Aiko ran towards Sakura, who stood with a group of girls chatting and giggling near the tracks. I got it, Aiko exclaimed, thrusting the book towards Sakura. Sakura's eyes widened as she took the book from Aiko's hands. I can't believe you did it, she said, a smile on her lips. Aiko glanced back at Yumi, who was now close behind her with tears in her eyes. Yumi's breath caught in her throat as she reached Sakura and Aiko, her hands outstretched. Please, you can have my book back, she begged. It looks pretty old, Sakura teased. Are you sure you don't want a new one? Yumi shook her head, eyeing the book desperately. Oh, I see, it's sentimental. Shakura shifted on her feet. How much is it worth to you? Anything. I'll do anything, Yumi said. Anything, huh? Sakura looked at Aiko, her smirk widened into a grin. Then, with one swift motion, she hurled the book onto the train tracks below. It fell between the rails in a pile of mangled pages sticking up from a splayed spine. How about play fetch? Sakura said to Yumi, and everyone giggled. A few seconds later, their train arrived noisily at the station, and the book disappeared underneath. Aiko felt a sting of guilt as she looked at Yumi's devastated expression. She wanted to apologize, to make things right, but Sakura was watching her now, and she didn't want to do anything that might disappoint her. Good dog, Sakura said, stepping onto the train, and Aiko wasn't sure who she was talking to. As everyone except Yumi boarded the train, Aiko got a nauseous feeling in her stomach. She knew what they had done was unforgivable, and yet still she said nothing. The next day they heard the news of Yumi's death. The girl had inexplicably thrown herself in front of a train, where she died instantly. Still, Aiko said nothing. The old woman listened patiently. When Aiko finished, a long silence passed between them. When finally the woman spoke, her voice was low and reverent. It's a tiki-tiki, she said. A spirit bound by anger. You want to appease her wrath, but the only true remorse can mend what is broken. The tiniest hope passed through Aiko. Is there anything I can do? A ritual? The woman shook her head. There are no shortcuts. You need to seek out the place where Yumi's spirit left this world and ask for forgiveness. Aiko gripped the edge of the table so tightly her knuckles turned white. But it was so long ago. The Yukami-san leaned forward. For you, maybe. For her, only a moment. Leaving the crumbling building behind, Aiko stepped back into the sun, shielding her eyes from the glare. For the first time since the nightmare began, she saw a light ahead. Late that night, carrying an armful of white lilies, Aiko returned to Asakusa Station. After burying the lilies from a small flower shop, she called Sakura and explained everything that happened to her. Sakura listened to the entire story without saying a word, including when she talked of what the old woman said about seeking forgiveness. "'Why are you telling me this?' Sakura asked. "'I want you to go with me so we can put this behind us.' <laughs> Sakura sniffled. "'But it's already behind me. I never blamed myself for what that girl did to herself. Neither should you. You dared me to take the book, and I did it. 
She was only trying to get it back when... The crew's voice cut out as she pictured Yumi scared and alone on the tracks. Please, I go back, go with me. Don't call me again, Sakura said and hung up. Now the station felt even emptier than the last time, a light at the center of a vast ocean. She went to the spot she stood in before, the place she swore she'd never come back to, and carefully arranged the offering on a makeshift shrine. A cold wind swept across the platform as Aiko prayed for forgiveness. She stayed in the silence of the train station for what felt like hours, until her legs and feet had gone numb. She considered leaving and trying again another night, returning every night if she had to. But then she heard it. Tick! Tick! Aiko turned away from the shrine and faced the tracks just in time to see a dark shadow rise up from the space below. The horrifying apparition, black-haired and bloodied, dragged itself upon the tracks with splintered fingernails. Slowly, it crawled toward Aiko, a moan escaping its mangled lips as its bloody stump scraped the platform. Aiko fell to her knees and lowered her head. Forgive me, she cried. I was just a little girl. I didn't know what I was doing. The dark figure lunged its bleeding fingertips inches from Aiko's face. But then it stopped. The moaning and screaming were replaced by silence. Aiko looked up at Yumi, the girl's face a frozen mask of terror. I'm sorry, Yumi, she said, the words raw in her mouth. Yumi stared at her with impossibly white eyes, pools of black at their centers. Aiko looked back at her with the faintest of hope that her long nightmare might be coming to an end. The mangled girl's hand shot out, clamping around Aiko's wrist. A scream escaped Aiko's throat as she was yanked forward and dragged kicking toward the tracks. Yumi's grip was impossibly strong. Aiko might as well have been fighting the ocean. Without pause... Yumi threw herself onto the tracks, dragging Aiko down with her. They fell a long distance, Yumi holding Aiko's wrist tightly the entire way down. Lucky for Aiko, they missed the third rail, but the impact of her body slamming into the ground knocked the wind out of her. As she shook off the dizziness and tried to sit up, Aiko became aware of a rumbling in the ground beneath her, a vibration in her ears. Then a headlight pierced the darkness ahead. Aiko tried to scramble off the tracks, clawing at the rough concrete, but Yumi's grip held her in place. No! Aiko screamed, her voice lost in the approaching roar of the train. Yumi, her face an unending scream, held Aiko like an old friend. Then the train was on them, the deafening screech of metal filling the air. Aiko squeezed her eyes shut so she didn't have to see. When she opened them again... Her thoughts were consumed only with one thing, finding Sakura and making her pay for what she'd done. Aiko dragged herself into the shadows of the train tracks. Eh, lighter now, without the burden of her legs, fingernails scraping along the ground. Dick! Dick! This episode's brought to you by Mint Mobile. Ever get that feeling after doing a little spring cleaning where you feel relaxed, comfortable, ready to take on whatever life gives you? I know that feeling, but the thing is, it doesn't just have to be a one-day thing, and it doesn't just have to be those boxes you had in the basement taking up space. Oh, no. Cleaning up can be for your finances as well. Why not go through your monthly fees and get rid of all the junk piling up there? And you know where a great place to start is? Your monthly phone bill. Look at it. Mostly fees and unnecessary services. Well, now's the time to clean it up. I say there's no better way to get spring cleaning on your phone bill like switching to Mint Mobile with unlimited wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month. Let's get down to it. What is that bloated wireless bill doing for you? Unlimited talk and text? 
Mint Mobile does that. Stable and efficient wireless. Mint Mobile does that too, on the largest 5G network in the nation. Afraid you can't keep your number on your phone? Mint Mobile lets you keep your current number, your current phone, and all your contacts. Make you the envy of your friends and relatives? Well, maybe Mint Mobile can't guarantee that, but your current provider can't either. And telling everyone how much money you saved isn't a bad idea at all. Last I checked, the other three are definitely on Mint Mobile's side. So why wait any longer when you can get that peace of mind that comes from unloading the junk in your life? I say the choice is clear. Get the wireless you need, the service you deserve, for just 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on a first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. I hope you enjoyed Tick Tick by Brian Martinez, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented featured author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Brian dash Martinez. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash B-R-I-A-N dash M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Well... If you can't beat them, join them, I suppose. Or make them join you, if you look at it from the right angle. You know, sometimes I'm guilty of it, but when I think of Asia, I realize that sometimes I don't consider Russia. But tonight, War and Peace does, as he brings us the story of a married couple moving out into the country to find rest, and of the neighbor who's very excited to meet them. Without further ado, I present to you A Will of Iron. It was overcast, but that was to be expected. It was almost always overcast here, and it was exactly as Michael hoped it would be. He glanced over at Deborah as the jeep bounced up and down the winding road and smiled. It had taken some convincing to get her to move away from all the hubbub of the city and come out here to the countryside, surrounded by the mists and pine trees of the Pacific Northwest. She had been reluctant to leave behind all her friends and family, but in the end, as he looked at her wandering eyes and face, he knew they had made the right choice. Of course they had. The city was too much, too full of people, the work too bothersome and unpleasant. This was where they needed to be away from it all, where they could start a family without people asking how the kids were doing, were they going to the right schools, why wasn't there a trust fund for Juilliard in their future, and that sort of thing. He'd grown tired of the endless struggling for meaning and work, for status, All he ever saw around him were people trying to get their share, climb the corporate ladder, be number one, and then were never happy when they got it. There were always new conquests ahead, and it drove him nuts to watch it day in and day out. No, he was determined that if peace existed, that he could be happy with less, and he would do it. So he bought a house. It wasn't as expensive as he thought it would be, and his years of sales, he'd wisely saved up enough that he could pay for it off in cash. The Jeep was next. Then he found a job that he could do remote, something that didn't pay anywhere near what he was making now, but since he didn't have a mortgage or rent to cover anymore, he didn't need quite so much. And there was Deborah. 
She still enjoyed the high life, wanted finer things, but he told her that she could have it all without the brush and the noise. They weren't abandoning everyone. It would just be a slightly longer drive to see them. And who knows? Maybe they would see how great it was being out in the hinterlands, and they too would come out and join them. But then, there were things beyond that where he and Deborah didn't see eye to eye. But that was the spice of life, wasn't it? They couldn't agree on everything, nor should they. If they agreed 100%, life would be boring. It was a give and take, tug of war. Sometimes one would win, the other would lose. But that didn't mean it was a bad thing. Marriage was compromise, after all. They eventually turned off the main road onto a dirt drive, and after a few moments, the house emerged from the trees. It wasn't too far from the main road. Michael didn't want to rough it that much, but it was still a wonderful place. With a false log cabin exterior that hid an extremely pleasant interior. It wasn't the apartment of the city, it was far more rustic, but it was well appointed and it had something the city didn't have space. Space to move, get a dog, and not the dogs her friends had, those little yappers with no faces, or the chihuahuas with their constantly bared teeth and rolling eyes. Space to make a real life. A cozy breakfast, a cup of coffee, looking out into the early morning mist with no honking or trains or gunshots, though he was glad he had only ever those a couple of times. He got out, and so did she, and together they stood close, looking up at their front porch. What do you think? Deborah tilted her head a few times. You're right. It isn't the city, but it's cozy. They kissed, a short, quiet peck on the lips, just two people who loved each other, but perhaps had fallen slightly out of love with each other. It would work. It had to work. This place was where it would all fall into place once again. And then the sound he hadn't expected to hear. Another car. He turned to see a mud-splattered pickup truck pulling up behind them. Surprised, he instinctively stepped in front of Deborah. Who would have known they would be here? How could they? A young man, maybe in his mid-twenties, got out. He had short-cropped black hair and was sporting a neatly kept beard. He waved cheerfully, but when he spoke, his accent was so thick that there was no mistaking him for a Seattle native. Ah, hello. You, you, uh, you're the new ones moving in, eh? Michael frowned. Yes, um, and you are? The man laughed. Ah, yes, yes. I am Timur. I live just up the road a ways. You're from America, yes? Well, yes, I am. I'm Michael, and this is Deborah. Ah, Mikhail. Fantastic. Fine Russian name. Well, I'm not sure my family's Russian at all. Please, if you named Mikhail, you are an honorary Russian. Michael and Deborah looked at each other, unsure what to make of this stranger, who had simply shown up on their new doorstep when they had not even stepped inside their new home. Well, uh, what was your name again? Timur. Ah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bother, if that's what is going on. I'm still new to country and think perhaps I had come on too strong, yes? It's just nice to see neighbors in the area. Maybe once you settle in, maybe a day or two, we could go for drinks at a pub. There was a good one, a little ways from here. More than happy to join you there. Michael got himself ready to decline. After all, they're just too new around here and wanted to get away from it. But Deborah stepped ahead. Well, certainly, Timur. We'd love to have a few drinks. Maybe tomorrow night, though, so we have time to get moved in properly. Our truck is arriving in the morning, so we'll probably be ready for some entertainment after all that's done. Timur beamed. Sure, sure. See you tomorrow, then. With that, he got back in his truck, waved through the windshield, and backed away down the road. Michael waved back, but as soon as the truck trundled away, his face fell. Really? Drinks? We didn't even know the guy. Deborah glared back, pushing her hair back over her shoulder. 
Honestly, Michael, he's a neighbor, and he seems like a nice guy. We shouldn't go out of our way to make enemies. We're in the middle of nowhere. How can we possibly make enemies? Well, by not going out for drinks. Fine. We're going to be exhausted after moving, though. Deborah moved in close, placing her hand on Michael's chest, and walked two fingers up to the edge of his throat. Then all the more reason to get nice and buzzed, dearest. Come on. Get towels out of the back. I'm dying to use the shower. Michael hadn't wanted to leave that first full day. The movers brought everything in, which turned out to be a lot less than he thought, until he realized just how small their previous apartment was, and he had found himself wandering the spacious rooms, thinking about how he would spend his mornings, now that he wouldn't even have to sign in for meetings until almost 11 a.m., he finally tasted that moment of relaxation, and now he didn't want to let it go. But Deborah was probably right. It would be good to meet people in the area. They wouldn't entertain often, but they would have to occasionally. Best not to make the locals feel unwelcome. The bar itself was a biker's bar, Ivan's, and based on the shabbiness of the wood exterior and the peeling paint on the inside, it was both built and last renovated sometime in the mid-70s. Michael and Deborah both ordered while they waited until they saw the muddy pickup truck pull up outside. Timur hopped out and practically skipped inside. He greeted them less like an adult man and more like an excited puppy, though Michael was surprised when he ordered a glass of vodka. Not a shot, not a double, but a glass, and he thoroughly enjoyed it. The conversation was friendly enough. Timur had come to the U.S. before all the Ukrainian fighting. Though he was concerned about his citizenship getting revoked, if it was decided, he was no longer welcome. Michael and Deborah shared with him, as well as the drinks loosened their tongue. He used to be in real estate, brokering apartments and office space for businesses. She'd been a freelance article writer for an online style magazine, and she used to interview a number of notables. So, Timur, what do you do? He raised his hands in a sort of a shrug, three quarters of his glass gone. I do a little bit of this and that. Where I come from, you do what you can get to get by. I love your Northwest here, though. Reminds me so much of home. Deborah put down her own drink. Speaking of home, you know, it's, it's so weird. Whenever I think of Russia... I always think of it as a really large part of Europe, but it's really Asia, you know. Which do you feel a part of? Timur chuckled, but then waggled a finger at her. No, no. Russia, not Europe. Russia, not Asia. Russia is Russia. Not like anywhere else. He took another large mouthful from the glass. Our heart, our soul, so different. Do you ever read our folklore? We are people who find dignity in hardship, joy, and deep sadness. His smile slowly vanished as he looked out the window. Opposite also true. You can have much joy, be proud, and inside, your mind turns on itself in great embarrassment and sadness. But what can one do? Life is as it is, and we must find in it what we can. Deborah pouted, reaching out a hand to place on Timur's. He looked back at her, and for a moment their eyes connected. For most, it would have been nothing. For Michael, it stirred up emotions he thought were over. Uh, something bad happened to you, Timur? Timur withdrew his hand. Well, something bad happens to everybody. It's inevitable. Yes, in a matter of speaking, Russia left me. You mean you left there? No, she left me. She not the same as she used to be. It was beautiful there, but like I say, the soul that was there, not there anymore. To here I came, and I think I find it. Well, I'm glad for that. Michael picked up his third shot, rolled it to his lips, then flicked it upside down on the table. If anyone's going to find something, what they're looking for, this is the place to do it. Land of opportunity. 
You have to have the drive and the spirit to take it. Uh, Russia, not like that. You get because it is there, and if it is not there, you move on until it does. Why? If it's there and it's your dream, go for it. As it said this, though, Michael cast a sidelong glance at Deborah and down where their hands met on the table earlier. Though, make sure it's your dream and not someone else's. Timur looked at Michael, and the young Russian began to smile once again. All right, while we are together tonight, more drinks. Michael recalled little of the night after that, though somewhere in the conversation, he recalled somebody making a crack about only a place like Russia could invent vodka, but he didn't know who said it. It might have been him for all he knew. Still, for all his happy glow, Michael still did not trust Timur. He didn't want to think ill of their new neighbor, but there had been too much history to deny his suspicion. The city was just too busy. That's where they had to go. Nothing else. Michael knew something had to be up when Deborah had asked him to go get a carton of milk from the store for the second time in a week. He never drank that much. Or must be the mountain air or something. I know it's weird, but I just don't think it's fair to have someone drive up here to deliver a couple of groceries this late in the day. But it's okay for me to risk driving up and down in the dark. Mike, it's a jeep. Don't be dramatic. Marriage is a compromise, he reminded himself. He stepped off the porch and headed for the jeep when he had a thought. Going around back, he looked at the trash cans. Michael still loved the solitude and quiet of the forest, but one thing he regretted was having to cut the trash cans down to the main road for pickup, since they refused to drive up the dirt roadway. He kept them permanently stored on a trailer for just that reason. He opened the trash can, and nowhere inside did he see a carton of milk. Closing the lid, he stood near the can for a moment or two, then went to his jeep, got in, and drove down to the main road. He did not, however, go all the way to town. After two minutes, he U-turned and came back around. Arriving back at the dirt road, he shut off the lights and carefully pulled forward. There, in the driveway, a muddy pickup truck. It was only about fifty minutes later that the young Russian man came from the house got into the truck and started back down the dirt road. It was when he pulled onto the main road that the jeep, sitting with its lights off on the gravel shoulder, slowly came after it. Michael watched for the turnoff. He'd never seen Timur's driveway, though until now he never had reason to. He watched the truck pull off onto a dirt road barely visible in the woods. He continued on a moment longer, then came back when Timur had clearly driven far enough in that Michael wouldn't be noticed. He bounced along the road, concerned that maybe now he really should be turning his lights to help him see, but when he made out the pickup truck ahead, he parked a good distance away. Went back to the back of the jeep where he had stored the bat he'd taken from the garage while waiting for Timur to leave his house. He went to the pickup and considered if that was where he should begin, but decided against it. Find Timur first and teach him a lesson, then the truck. The truck, after all, wasn't going anywhere and wouldn't fight back. The city was a busy place, a place of busy hands, fashion designers who liked to drink, who liked to get others drunk, who had no scruples about who they invited to their apartments to get more, exclusive coverage. That was what had started the search for the house. The fatigue was there, yes, and the noise, but it was the gossip that was the worst. And even worse, she admitted it fully on first asking. She'd been sorry, of course, most were, but Michael could forgive. It was drinking, after all, and they lived what he assumed was a very lax and permissive lifestyle. But the designer he could not... She confessed, and he was able to deal with the problem. Marriage was a compromise, after all. He passed the truck on the lookout for Timur's home. 
You couldn't see it from here, but it had to be close. Why park so far away? Unless, of course, Timur had known he was being followed, and this was all some kind of setup to get a drop on Michael. He glanced around, but he didn't see anywhere that anyone could leap out on top of him or sneak up on him. It was a forest with plenty of trees to hide behind, but nothing substantial. It was all loose foliage, skinny pines, and any collapsed trees were too far away. He did see, though, that there was a trail. It wasn't clear, but it did exist. Footprints had trod the earth to the point where it could be followed. Michael clicked on his phone flashlight and walked the path, watching the sneaker prints climb up into the mountainside. And then he arrived and gulped. The footsteps did not arrive at some kind of mansion in the middle of the forest, nor, as he had hoped, a rundown shack with the scatterings of a meth lab or hoarder. Instead, there was just a yawning mouth of a cave, about fifteen feet tall and wide enough for both of their cars to park side by side. Why in the world was Teemer here? He wanted to turn and go, which would have been a smart, sensible thing to do. He could go home, talk to Deborah, find out what was going on, and in the light of day, confront Timur and make him confess to what he'd done. And then maybe, with the law on his side, he'd have his justice. But when sense would have overruled anything, came the voice from the cave. Mikhail, that you, my friend? You come to visit? The voice was so sudden that Michael almost dropped the bat. Timur? Why are you in a cave? There's no cave, friend. It's my home. It's not as nice as your home, but I make do to get by. Michael tried to peer into the darkness, but even with his phone, he couldn't see anything within. How could Tima talk so he could hear him, but not be close enough to see? Why do you live in a cave? I told you. Your northwest reminds me of home. But a home is no longer the same. Michael's grip began to feel clammy, sweaty. This no longer seemed like the situation he thought he could fix. This was not a matter of breaking some fingers or roughing someone up and leaving him in an alley. He began to feel a primal fear of something that existed long before him and would exist long after. He also noticed that, though the accent stayed... Timmy's grasp of English was getting better. Have you heard of strip mining? Where I live, they kept many valuable things, but I never dreamed that the mountain itself was valuable to people. It was leveled, so I left. I tried to live in the city, but that was not the same. So why not travel? All I have ever seen is one mountain. But I fell in love here, and I stayed. Maybe I'll move again soon. Who's to say? Deborah can join me. Michael felt his resolve return. That's my wife you're talking about. She belongs to you? So did most of the wives. I've loved through the centuries, belong to their husband, but things change. My home is gone. Didn't it belong to me? I've defended her once. I'll do it again. A large, loud, rattling sound came from the cave. It sounded massive, like the sound of a very large animal taking a deep breath. I can smell your anger. And your fear. But I do not smell death. You've never killed anyone. And here you stand with a stick like that. For centuries, I've faced princes who've befriended wondrous people with many supernatural skills or warriors with a sword in their hand and courage in their hearts. You have nothing. You are alone with your arrogance and pride to provide no shield at all. Michael heard a heavy thumping as something began to lurch from the cave. He backed away, his resolve turned to nothing. Yes, Mikhail, you did give me good advice. Instead of waiting for it to happen... I should chase my dream and take what I want. It is your custom, is it not? Michael fell to the ground as the impossibly large shape emerged. 
He could make out little in the darkness other than the creature's sheer size, its reptilian form, and its twelve twisting necks, the shining eyes at the end. And as the first of the sets of teeth began to dive into his leg, Michael's thoughts were not on how close it was to the end. Instead, his mind was on one thing. Which was it? Which was the right answer? Fighting to achieve your destiny, or passively accepting fate? And, as the second set of teeth closed over his head, before all thought was snuffed out completely, he realized that one wasn't better than the other, and sometimes one won, and the other lost. It was a compromise, after all. I hope you enjoyed A Will of Iron by War and Peace as performed by yours truly. Some of you may be wondering what that thing happened to be. Well, all I can say is check out folklore of various countries through that little thing we call the Internet. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by what you find, and not just about this story. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured authors, as well as all of the authors who provided us with tonight's stories. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium, extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well, at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. 
That's O T I S at simply scary podcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.